Thanks, Surgeon, for welcoming me. Thanks, everyone, for joining this talk after lunch. <laughs> uh, must have been heavy, but I hope you make it through this talk, which I hope to keep light. And uh, um, I mean, I would ask if you would prefer to ask questions in between, but what do you know about my presentation, right? <laughs> so let, let, let's, let's keep it as we have been doing so far. You can ask me uh, questions at the end. Um, my name is Sahil. I work for Gina AI as a head of product. Been working there for four years now. Um, at Gina AI, we uh, build foundation models uh, for search and retrieval. And you'll, of course, hear a lot more about what we do in the company uh, in the coming slides. Uh, but what I want to start with is the fact that it's the second day of this conference today and probably the 1,000th time that someone has told you uh, that in 2022, everything in retrieval and search changed, basically, <laughs> right? And I do want to repeat that point. Uh, but what will also not shock you, uh, I hope, is the fact that since the same time, the number of contributions to open source Gen AI projects, both in terms of new projects that came up and the number of contributions that went up in existing projects, also shot up insanely much, right? Which should not be a shocker to any one of you. And in fact, um, almost all of the generative AI development that we've seen since and even before that has basically all been based on open source. Right? And a great example of this is, of course, a transformer architecture. For those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a neural network architecture transformers that allows you to do uh, things like uh, time series prediction. So working with data that is based on a sequence of events happening. And before transformers came around, the typical way that people work with sequential data or deep learning scientists work with sequential data was to use something called recurrent neural networks. And uh, these recurrent neural networks were fine up to a certain point, but as soon as you ask them to remember things from long, far ago, uh, that's when they really failed, right? Because of simply the nuances of the architecture, something called exploding gradient, which I don't need to go into right now. But uh, transformers were basically a kind of paradigm shift in how people uh, started to deal with sequential data. In the fact that instead of looking at data in terms of at which timestamp um, a word or a musical note came in, uh, transformers allowed you to look at the entire musical sheet at once. Right? Uh, and then you were left with treating this problem less as a next token prediction, but more as a fill in the blanks. Right? You have some blanks on the musical sheet by looking at everything that came in the past and everything that's probably going to happen in the future, you were able to predict, well, what should this blank be? That's what Transformers allowed you to do. Right? It was a massive paradigm shift. But by far, for me, the coolest, things, uh, the coolest thing about Transformer was that it was open source. So everybody could build on top of transformers their own uh, foundation models. Uh, later on, these foundation models, uh, of course, started, started being recognized as LLMs. And even the most popular LLMs today are all based on the transformer architecture, including ChatGPT. So um, having said that transformer is a great example of an open source contribution to the LLM world, actually, it's not by far the only one. Right. Uh, I love looking at this chart, and I want to start by uh, going through it from the bottom, maybe a little bit. So, in terms of developer tools, right? Uh, what you see in the second and third column are the open source um, elements that you could put together uh, to build uh, developer tools and vector databases. And on the on your right side, uh, the column tells you basically uh, their closed source. Uh, counterparts. And as you can see, almost in all of the rows, the closed source counterparts are by far, uh, far fewer than uh, open source ones, which is not a shocker. But also what is important to know is that the developer tools and vector databases in the open source bucket are also far more widely used in production. At least in our experience of working with these clients in the past, we've seen far many users using Chroma, Milvers, Hugging Face, of course, as a repository uh, of developer tools. Uh, same is also true in case of model deployment and inference tools, where there's far more interesting work happening on the open source side, uh, which is, of course, adapted to some extent and also innovated on, to a large extent uh, on their closed source counterparts. But in my experience, uh, the, open, the open source alternatives are far more interesting to look at. And of course, uh, including ourselves at Gina, uh, all of the other foundation model providers uh, that are in open source have 
equally good, if not sometimes even better counterparts to their close source uh, model alternatives. Uh, it might be a daring thing to say right now, but if you go down into the use cases of what people are using LLMs for, uh, it becomes quite apparent that f for a lot of use cases, after doing extensive human or non-human evaluation, it becomes clear that some of the foundation models on the open source side, like Llama 3, uh, Mistral, uh, they perform actually far better than their closed source alternatives. Uh, including the ones from OpenAI uh, and Anthropic. But having talked about LLMs, uh, it is also a fact, and uh, this is an elephant in the room uh, that has been addressed many times, that they suffer from hallucinations. The open source LLMs, closed source LLMs, all suffer from hallucinations. And uh, by now, this is not news to any one of you who's been here for one and a half days by now, that there is uh, at least a tool in our tool belt uh, to deal with, LL, uh, with LLM hallucinations, which is Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG. And, um, well, first of all, RAG is only one tool to hope uh, we can solve hallucinations, uh, but the fact that hallucinations happen at all is completely built into the architecture of LLMs altogether. But um, uh, regardless of that, what RAG allows you to do is ground your LLMs into facts that you know are true, or basically facts about your own use case or your company's use case uh, that should be relevant for an LLM to give you an answer. And how this works is actually uh, qu quite, uh, quite simple. Uh, you would use the user's question and so-called embed it uh, using an embedding model. And I will soon come into what embedding models are. Um, these embedding models capture the semantics of your user's question. You match these semantics uh, to all of the semantics of your facts or your company's uh, fact database that you store in a vector database. And actually, uh, then ask the LLM to just base its answers on these facts. That's it, right? But the instruction part to the LLM is actually the easy part of RAG. The harder part is how to make sure that only the most relevant facts are uh, retrieved by the vector database exactly when you need it. And um, once you have a way like this to ground LLMs in fact and truth, so to say, it unlocks obviously a lot of applications. One of the applications that we've seen uh, a lot of our uh, enterprise users have unlocked for themselves is uh, on the creative content creation side, for example, where a lot of the work has now moved on to the editing side of what uh, humans and experts are doing, whereas most of the first copies, most of the initial drafts are created by LLMs, if I may say so. Um, same is true for uh, customer support, for example, where uh, you might have yourself interacted with a lot of chatbots on uh, or chatbots and customer service bots on websites that are mostly all LLM driven and are in fact based on uh, facts of the company, the documents that might be able to answer your questions uh, and all connected in a RAG pipeline. And same is true for uh, legal services, obviously. You can think of many use cases there. Uh, one use case that I really love uh, that we built recently recently for one of our uh, enterprise users was the following where, um, so I really love this use case because it demonstrates the flexibility of RAG really, right? Uh, and the way it does it is as follows. So this user uh, came to us and said that, okay, we have a lot of company internal documents that our employees ask us questions about and kind of like bug us with them. So one employee asking on Slack, hey, how many holidays am I entitled to uh, this year? Uh, and so on. And for these kind of questions, this employee would, of course, have to go to your company's um, policy database, pull up the vacation policy, which would be able to answer this question. So this company really wanted to automate this process, create a Slack bot where you could ask this question to a bot who would answer this question to you. And what they did was uh, basically create a rag around it, completely using open source solutions. Okay, including ours. So uh, they use Mistral's uh, 8 billion model as their LLM. Uh, they also use an LLM, very interestingly, to do a query classification, right? So for example, if the question that your user is asking you is something like, hey, how many Jira tickets was created in, uh, in my project since May 2025, uh, May 24, sorry, uh, actually, the best way to answer this question is to query 
uh, a NoSQL or a SQL database because this date filter that is implicit in the natural language query has a direct counterpart to uh, to a structured query in a structured or non-structured database like uh, MongoDB or MySQL, right? So this query classifier exactly did this kind of classification where the semantic search uh, branch was only triggered when the question was something like, hey, who should I ask to review my PR, which is about uh, closing a bug or patching a vulnerability uh, related to XML parsing, right? For those kind of use cases, they would use embeddings um, to then query a vector database. Uh, in their case, they used Quadrant, but you could, of course, use any of the other many uh, open source counterparts to it. And then uh, the answer was then uh, so-called re-ranked. Uh, and you must have also heard about this term re-ranking a lot of times in, uh, in today's and yesterday's presentation. The idea is that re-ranking is the slower brother of embeddings. And the idea is that to compensate for the speed um, downside of re-ranking, you would get a bunch of candidates from vector database to re-rank and you assume that your answer is somewhere in that bunch of can candidates. And the re-ranker that the client ended up using was also an open source re-ranker. Uh, the information was given back to the LLM, and then um, uh, the answer was uh, uh, given back to the client. And as I said, this, this is a really interesting use case uh, because it was built completely using open source solution. Right? So I've given you an enterprise use case built completely using open source solution. So that's great, right? What is not so great is the uh, incumbency advantage that is already showing up in the Gen AI uh, industry right now. It actually has a lot of counterparts and a lot of uh, callbacks to the incumbency advantages that we saw in the dot-com bubble of the 90s, um, and it's become very, very apparent very quickly. Just as an example, let's, let's look at the revenue numbers of some of the companies that you might have heard of in Gen AI. OpenAI was reported to hit a revenue of 2 billion US dollars uh, last year, uh, according to some sources. Private company, we have no way to like definitively uh, confirm this information. Uh, on the other hand, or basically just the next uh, counterpart to OpenAI, which is Cohere, uh, was able to make 13 million US dollars of revenue, which is close to 1 200th of the revenue that OpenAI made uh, in the same year, which goes on to show you the kind of discrepancy that there is between one entrenched player and just the next player, basically, in the queue, right? On the other end of extreme, you have uh, Beijing Academy of AI, which is, of course, an educational institute, has no interest in uh, building revenue uh, for uh, its foundation models. But between OpenAI and BAAI, there's a slew of open source and closed source generative AI startups that sadly uh, are probably seeing the same kind of fate as a lot of early innovators in the dot-com bubble uh, were seeing. But before we go into some prescriptive measures of what um, our experience has been uh, in order to fight the incumbency challenges. Um, let's at least look at a few characteristics of these examples, right? OpenAI has at least one great foundation model. There's no denying that uh, uh, GPT 3.5 uh, onwards, their foundation models have been absolutely stunning, uh, if there is even just one foundation model, which I don't think there is. Um, a well-oiled PR machine, obviously, and multiple revenue streams. Right? given their size and given the fact that they're, of course, backed by uh, an entrenched player in, uh, in the IT landscape altogether with almost virtually unlimited compute resources, gives them unique advantages, obviously. Then let's look at Cohere high-quality models and uh, notice that um, I use a singular for OpenAI while a multiple for Cohere because I really do think that Cohere's suite of models are all extremely high quality. Uh, and all of them show extremely high performance on, e on independent benchmarks. So uh, I would put them in the bucket of having high quality models uh, while still being closed source. Um, and BAAI, as I said, a research uh, institute uh, has smaller yet very competitive, highly uh, capable models, both on embedding side, on LLM side, um, and are completely open source. Now, um, the North Star for a company like ours uh, would look something like this, which is not unique to a company like ours. So we would obviously like to have high quality models across the board like Cohere does. 
we would also like to be financially thriving as Upani Hai does uh, in the perfect world while uh, maintaining our commitment to the open source landscape actually where we pull all of our data for training our models from scratch and actually the reason why we are even here uh, at the stage talking to you about uh, the state of open source Gen AI. Now, um, in order to reach this stage, uh, there are a bunch of challenges that I've categorized in the slides following, uh, which will form the base of the rest of my presentation as well. Um, and these are the challenges which I think are uh, not unique to our company alone, but is faced by a lot of similar uh, companies and organizations in, uh, in kind of the same place as we are. The first challenge uh, is that of quality due to the amount of competition that uh, you have in the field of generative AI today, both on the academic and the commercial side, the speed of innovation is simply breathtaking, right? Uh, and given the speed of innovation, and given that almost all companies, regardless of their size and resources, are competing amongst the same pool, there is actually no excuse for uh, even a smaller company to not have as its first priority high quality products, high quality models that exceed uh, uh, the capabilities of similar models on open benchmarks. Open benchmarks are basically what everybody's going by today. Uh, and in this presentation, I'm not going to touch upon why I do think that uh, evaluating models uh, is one of the biggest problems in Gen AI today when we're all only building POCs. Regardless of that, on open benchmarks, uh, smaller startups like ourselves do have to exceed uh, bigger players who, um, in our language, you call them GPU rich. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen these hats going around on the social media with GPU rich and GPU poor, uh, but this is actually uh, absolutely a fact of the day uh, that GPU rich uh, companies are able to train these models at a much faster pace and also train many versions of these models at the same time so that they can pick and choose which of the versions is worth going public with. So the first challenge is uh, that of quality and how to maintain a competitive advantage only by using the quality of your models. The second challenge is that of discoverability. Uh, and even a high quality developer tool uh, is only as good as the amount of business value that it can unlock down the line. The amount of downstream products that use these developer tools are built using these developer tools and how much business value then that they can generate. And given the fact that we're already seeing a little bit of a winner takes all mentality in the field of generative AI, it becomes even more important that smaller startups like ours find some way to differentiate ourselves not only on the basis of the quality of our product, but on the basis of do actually people find us uh, when they're looking for solutions to problems that we generate. And the last problem, which is actually quite related to the first two uh, problems itself, uh, is that of monetization. Uh, given that there's a clear incumbency advantage to uh, bigger players in this field, uh, enterprises today are really choosing to go with POCs. Uh, and these POCs, more than anything else, are a proof of whether there is a viability of this business succeeding at all, right? Viability of a business that is based on an LLM, whether this succeeds at all or not is the priority right now, not whether one or the other component in this generative AI POC is the best one that one could pick, right? And again, this goes all the way back to the evaluation problem that I shortly touched, touched upon, but at this moment in time, in 2024, there's a severe lack of willingness of large enterprises to invest in long-term development of LLM-based uh, or generative AI-based products, uh, and a high willingness to spend a lot of money on small POCs, many of them, to find out which of these business, mo business models are going to be viable for them. And as a result, for smaller startups like ourselves, it's very hard to capture that small bit of value from these POCs, especially uh, when there's a winner takes all mentality uh, out there. Now, in the remaining time I have with you, I want to basically uh, talk about how a generative AI startup, especially an open source generative AI startup like ourselves, uh, would deal with these three hurdles of uh, company success and being a force for good ultimately, discoverability, quality, monetization. In an ideal case scenario, we want to be at this sweet spot in the middle of these three circles where we are highly discoverable, are high quality across the board, and can also monetize fairly well to sustain uh, uh, developing products like this. And in order to solve uh, these problems, I will basically use 
quite well known uh, well to a lot of you it might also be intuitive but these are quite well known principles for uh, product management um, and this principle is as follows it's called a persona solution fit and the idea is that you identify a persona for example a developer that has a problem uh, you develop a solution that uh, hopefully solves this problem and you continuously measure how well the solution fits the problem. So has there ever been a time where there has been a degradation in your solution that it no longer fits the persona? Should you pivot? Uh, or was there ever a time where a solution was actually fit for this persona? So this is a pretty um, typical uh, framework used by product managers like myself to kind of justify having a day job. Uh, so I, I at least have to put it on here. Right, um, and um, I will use the example of my own company, uh, which is a four-year-old startup, uh, to show you along the way how we uh, have been uh, identifying personas, finding solutions for them, and measuring whether we uh, fit those solutions at all. So, uh, Gene AI was founded in 2020. Uh, the foundations were laid basically based on a one specific problem that the community had. Uh, that our co-founders uh, were able to narrow down on, and this was to create a framework for neural search solutions. Um, neural search applications, sorry. A neural search is basically the same as what is nowadays called vector search, uh, and this is what the problem was initially. Uh, we created a bunch of core infrastructure products, uh, one of them called Gina and the other one called Docker. Gina, the same name as a company. Uh, and Docker A stands for Document Array. And both of these elements, both of these open source elements, uh, allowed users or developers to build vector search solutions, which were cloud native, so that they can deploy it directly on any of the cloud service providers of their choice, right? Docker A in particular was very interesting because uh, it's like um, having Pydantic for machine learning uh, engineers. Uh, Pydantic is a Python framework which allows you to basically talk to your database with the same data objects that you have in Python without having to have like a transformation layer in between. And Docker A bridged this gap from the database all the way to uh, machine learning training uh, library as well. So you could use the same uh, uh, Python classes for training your models in PyTorch as you use for deploying an application on fast API without ever doing a transformation in between. Um, since then, uh, we've uh, donated Docker A to the Linux Foundation, and we are only maintainers of it now. Linux Foundation owns uh, Docker A at this point. Um, but in addition to that, in uh, 2021, we also um, uh, we also released Clip as Service uh, and Dali Flow, which are basically predecessors to a lot of the APIs that you see currently uh, deployed, for example, by OpenAI or Cohere for uh, getting LLM outputs for developers or basically using LLMs for developers or using embeddings for developers. So this, this was... Um, with the time scale that we're all used to today in 2024, this was quite a pioneering pioneering bunch of solutions, right? Um, and then uh, we put all of our effort after donating uh, to Linux Foundation into creating a fully managed solution of China uh, that we deployed ourselves, uh, that people could come to to develop their own uh, vector search applications, connect to vector databases that were provided as plug and play solutions, um, and get to build their solutions from scratch. So um, this was great, right? Seemingly, we had found something called a project community fit. Uh, and the measure that we used for f uh, measuring this project community fit was how many downloads that we get uh, on our uh, open source libraries on GitHub. A lot of people also would use stars as a measure for this. Uh, you can if you want to, but <laughs> there are ways to fake that that are not legitimate in my opinion, right? Uh, downloads is, a f is closer to being a proxy for actually how useful your uh, open source framework is. So we, uh, we had more than 8 million combined downloads of Gina and Docker A and um, basically we could just cash in at this point and go rest live the rest of our lives in peace, right? <laughs> <laughs> but no, that was not the case. Um, we found ourselves in a very uncomfortable situation at that point, where instead of being a company specializing in vector search, 
we started to be a company that was specializing in uh, cloud infrastructure management. <laughs> That's not what we wanted. Uh, we didn't want to compete with AWS and Azure at all. We actually wanted to partner with them so that we could bring our vector search solutions to the users that were already comfortable with AWS, right? Um, this started to show a little bit of a crack in our storyline of the project community fit being a completely good replacement for a product market fit. <laughs> um, and uh, the reason for this was that we didn't think opinionated AI clouds or opinionated managed clouds of any kind uh, were going to be the future of AI. Uh, or let's say we at least didn't think that we were the right people to build it. Right? Our expertise was completely in deep learning and uh, embedding models in vector search, and we wanted to continue being uh, experts in that. So uh, in 2023, uh, we said, okay, let's leverage this expertise that we have in vector search uh, to focus on a problem that really is important to our users, which is how to create uh, retrieval systems that are accurate. Uh, and all of these users were already used to using uh, state-of-the-art BM25 kind of engines, uh, which were highly accurate uh, in their opinion. Um, and that's what we were up against. And that's where we really felt confident that we could make a dent creating models that would make uh, retrieval systems as accurate as user were, users were asking for. So we developed uh, two uh, GINA embedding models, um, uh, GINA embeddings V2 and V1. Uh, and they were the first open source uh, embedding models in the world to support 8,000 tokens context length. Before this, the only other model that allowed this was OpenAI's text embeddings, ADA002. Um, and uh, we basically went on to fast follow this with also another re-ranker model. I will soon come to what a re-ranker model is. Uh, and termed an overarching term uh, called search foundation, which is, uh, which is our new um, narrative, if you may. What is search foundation? Just as a quick detour on this, uh, it's a combination of embedding models, which convert your data into vectors that you can quickly retrieve using a vector database. Uh, Re-rankers, which are highly accurate. Uh, as I said, they're accurate cousins of embedding models that uh, look at your data even more in fine granular detail. Uh, and then uh, prompt operation products, which allow you to pass this data to an LLM of your choice uh, that you can get the outputs out of and turn this into kind of a production system. And to combine all this together at the center, we have still our JCloud solution, uh, which we no longer have a managed offering for, but we dog fooded it uh, in our own company to create this search foundation models. Um, I'm no longer going to go into embeddings at all because you've heard a lot of talks about it. But I at least want to say that at this point, we thought, hey, this is product mar market fit, <laughs> right? Uh, and how do we know it's product market fit? Uh, we had a... We, we were accepted at a very highly regarded uh, research conference for uh, the paper that we published for Gina Embeddings. Um, we had 4 million downloads of our models combined on Hugging Face, uh, the most liked model on Hugging Face, if you may, uh, for feature extraction. And we were um, uh, processing almost one A4 size worth of information per second on our API that was paid as well. Right, so uh, we finally found product market fit. No, <laughs> we haven't. You knew this was coming, right? Uh, in January 24, uh, something um, something happened that kind of put a little bit of a dent into this uh, product market fit that we were uh, lulled into thinking that we had found. And this was that uh, the entrenched player, uh, OpenAI, uh, decided to reduce the price of their embedding models by five times. Right? And we, of course, had to fast follow this by reducing the price of our own API also by the same amount in some cases with a better package uh, as well, uh, which was great because we were actually able to convince a lot of people to switch from uh, OpenAI's embeddings to Gina embeddings at that point. Um, what was not so great is this came at a price to the company as well because the total lifetime value of these customers went down by a lot, while uh, the total amount of onboarding costs that we had per customer went up when we brought, those, brought down these prices uh, as well. Which got us thinking that, hmm, this company in San Francisco that is every six months coming out with an announcement that is making heavy uh, damage to our own business model, how could we go around competing with this company at all, right? So we thought, let's focus on what, uh, what we can do as an open source company to uh, build a business model that 
can more confidently navigate around having challenges like, not we are the challenges, uh, having uh, challenges from entrenched uh, players in the ecosystem. So we decided to focus on enterprise users at this point. Uh, and what this meant was that we figured out a very um, clear use case for large enterprises for having a safety first, a private uh, SOC 2 GDPR compliant uh, bunch of solutions for their use cases. Uh, and these enterprise users were not willing to send API calls all the way over the ocean. Right? So this is the group of users that we focused on. We worked with uh, cloud service providers, uh, Azure, AWS, to create uh, offerings directly on their cloud marketplaces, which were not available, at least that time, uh, from uh, similar players in Europe or abroad. And um, this gave us a lot of unfair advantages. Uh, one advantage was that we were able to do this really quickly because of our past experience in using G9 Docker A. So things were starting to come full cycle a little bit. Uh, this was also a great advantage for us because we really were no longer competing with AWS and Azure anymore. But we had good grounds of placing ourselves in the position of being their partners in the Gen AI uh, journey of their customers rather than competing with them. Right? So um, we think at this point we're at uh, we're at a place where we're working towards a value business fit, uh, even more than a, a product market fit. Um, and we've basically uh, come up with, let's say, a blueprint, which is also in my title, so at least I had to call it back a little bit, uh, at least a blueprint of how companies like ourselves uh, going forward in the future, in the present, can deal with similar problems of quality, discoverability, and monetization. First is to find a project community fit. Uh, uh, second is to focus on a product market fit following project community fit, and then focusing on a value business fit. And how do we achieve these three? Uh, to recap, we first of all focus on activating open source users as our community base to be champions of our technology, uh, to be advocates of our products to, uh, to their organizations, and also to encourage them to contribute to our ecosystem as well. That's what I really call a thriving open source uh, community. Uh, then we focused on understanding the needs of the users that were actually going to pay us. Those users who were hoping to build business value out of their own applications were the ones that we focused on, and their problems were the ones that we tried to solve with uh, G9 Beddings V2. And focusing on long-term partnerships, especially uh, this is true for foundation model providers when it comes to building long-lasting enterprise business value for your own, uh, for your own companies. Uh, the open source Gen AI story today looks a little bit like a David versus Goliath story, right? Um, there have been a lot of predictions of how quickly year on year open source uh, generative AI and generative AI in general is going to grow. Uh, next two years is going to be 100 billion market, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and all of the, this being said, and my earlier comments still withstanding, the fact that all of the generative AI landscape is today built on open source generative AI. A big chunk of this monetary pie is also up for grabs by open source challenges to incumbent players, right? Even, even if these open source uh, uh, challenges to the incumbents uh, end up being a few and consolidating, it's still the case that indie startups who are up for picking up the challenge of competing against OpenAI and Microsoft and Google, uh, Google's of the world are in it to win it. Thanks. Questions? Really great talk, Sal. Uh, uh, especially, I mean, also open source uh, sourcing, so it yeah. was like really valuable for me. Uh, my question is, how do you find right partners, and how do you like uh, ask them to invest in you as well? Like, you know, because uh, it is tough uh, out there right yeah. now. Everyone jumping in it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, I mean, the three circles of uh, discoverability, quality, and monetization are quite closely tied together as well. So uh, the, the way that we found, of course, that works the best is to start with the quality of your product first. And then that's basically your most likely chance that you will 
be also more discoverable. You could uh, focus on uh, spending the same amount of efforts on marketing with no guarantee that it will work at all. Uh, so it's a combination of being high quality in your field, which is, of course, easier said than done. But ultimately, that's what we have found has worked for us. Um, we found that it works much better for us to uh, publish these uh, research that we have in-house at conferences which are academic because a lot of the partners that we don't think are academically inclined are actually at these same venues listening to the same talks as the rest of us are. So um, we don't have to do something different for them, especially in 2024 in Gen AI when everybody wants to be an expert in Gen AI. <laughs> and they're also actually picking up the tools to be that. So uh, I think your best bet is to basically focus on the strength of your product. What is your differentiated value compared to anyone else? Um, uh, and also, like, really find partners who themselves are high-quality partners, not focus on short-term value. I mean, that's a little bit of a hand-wavy answer, but <laughs> sadly, that's all I can give you at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Sahil. Great presentation. And it's interesting to see uh, taking the product building angle and not just the technical side. Um, so can you give us some tips on experimentation? You describe an approach that's very iterative, where you need to move fast and to quickly measure the fit. Yeah. Do you have any tips how to do this and stay sane? Yeah, um, I mean, if you go on our website, you will see that we've not stayed sane by any any reasonable definition of sane. Uh, we've experimented a lot, and actually, we also like put everything on the website. Never took anything off. <laughs> I mean, uh, just to show like, okay, what is uh, what is the trajectory of this company look like? Um, I mean, if I have any tips on experimentation, I wouldn't say this is different from developing products in any other uh, sector. I really think that the best way that you have of experimentation is focus on your champions first. So there are um, there are user brackets that would seem much more ambitious to you and that would be like your ultimate goal uh, that you want to go towards. But as an early stage startup, you also have to be a little bit more open to the segments which you just happen to be clicking with. <laughs> You're not focusing on the, that segment. Like we, we, we used to have this hypothesis that all the e-commerce companies are basically our customers. Uh, that's what we wanted to focus on. But we found ourselves being in this very unexpected place of somehow clicking together with like process automation companies and HR tech companies, which we had never thought of. And it really is worth for early stage startups to be flexible enough that they focus on these use cases which are resonating with your product more and more uh, and kind of build a complete value chain for them instead of your ideal use case, which you might still find a way to eventually. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, well, give it up for Sahil. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>